Hello, everybody. Uh, a bunch of you already know me. Um, for the f a few of the people who don't know me yet, I'll introduce myself real quick. Um, my name is Chris Manson. You may recognize me from online with this picture of me and my dog. That is Rodney. Uh, he has a little friend called Susie these days, and both of them are endlessly tormented by my two daughters, Mary and Lexi. Uh, I work for an ever-growing web consultancy in Europe called Main Matter. Uh, that used to be Ember Consultancy, but we're doing a lot of weird and wonderful things these days, which is pretty cool. And my full-time project at the moment is the Embroider Initiative. So I do this 24-7, eat, drink, and sleep thinking about this stuff. Um, but more on that in a little bit. Um, this feels pretty good, being on a stage at EmberConf. I've been using Ember for 12 years, and being on stage here has been a dream of mine. Uh, even though it wasn't the first time I was accepted. Uh, we had a bit of a failure to launch in the fateful year, so I was recording in a very white, weird box uh, room. Um, and I missed that chance. I'm here now, and we're not talking about the past. We're talking about launching Ember into the future, and what does that actually mean? Um, there is... There is a lot going on in Ember at the moment. We've heard some of it already in talks. We've heard a lot of it in the talk just before me. Uh, and there's probably going to be a lot more uh, to hear for the rest of the conference. Um, I'm not focusing on any of the features. I'm focusing on the build system. And as Luke kind of introduced, it's about this transition from old things into the new things. We are translating the emberisms of old into modern JavaScript concepts. Um, and I could have structured this talk in any kind of way. It's a very hard thing to talk about. Well, it's a very easy thing to talk about. I could spend hours talking about it, but I'm not going to because it's lunch very soon. Um, I'm only going to talk about three things at a little bit of length. I'll try and keep it under the 30 minutes. But I want you all to come away from this talk with a better understanding of what Embroider is and why what it's doing is such a hard problem, um, how roll-up plugins work, and I'll explain why that's important in a little bit, and what the future build system actually looks like. So without further ado, let's dive in. Um, as Luke mentioned, uh, Ember CLI is very old. Uh, I don't know what year he quoted, but this was like one of the first uh, releases in the GitHub repo. Um, yeah, this was in a time when building things in the front end framework space was new, novel, and scary. And we were told what we were doing was wrong. And then everything changed <laughs> over the years. Um, but since that time, we've had a long, long time to add new features to Ember CLI, to the add-on ecosystem. And with those features, there's been more and more add-ons add created that used every single one of those features in, again, weird and wonderful ways. Um, and while this was all happening, if we cut over to another timeline for a second, um, there were a lot of uh, people working on uh, TC39, getting the ESM spec uh, finished and out the door. Um, and although they didn't quite finish everything when they were putting together the ESM spec, they, nobody talked about loaders for Node, and that caused a whole bunch of problems. Um, this, this brought in a new character to the story of what does it mean to build an, an app, any kind of JavaScript app for for the web, for the front end. Um, and this is kind of a turning point for JavaScript as well, because once you can start thinking about things in true modules, it starts to unlock things that you just really couldn't do before. Um, and that's something that we were kind of starting to get a bit locked into with Ember CLI. Um, we didn't really have ESM modules uh, all the way down. Um, you can kind of describe Ember CLI as a, 
a bit of a frantic or chaotic layering of random files on top of each other in strange ways. Um, and it's, I'm not saying this to be, you know, I'm not trying to say that Ember CLI was bad. Like we were all very productive on this, but the reason we were productive with Ember CLI was because of this sense of community. We all were in it together and we figured out how to make it work and how to like push through this weird layering system. But it was a bit brittle. It meant that we weren't really conceptualizing the things that we were building on top of Ember CLI. And as soon as you start to try and take advantage of the new things that were coming in the JavaScript ecosystem, um, such as tree shaking or root splitting, you get a situation like this. Things start to fall over. Um, the, this was about the same time that uh, Ed was probably thinking about Embroider, which I tried to find a good release date for this, but this was one of the early ones that I could find on the GitHub. I'm sure there was stuff before that. Um, but Embroider, if, if you don't know about it, is supposed to be this kind of translation layer. It's supposed to be something that you point at your Ember app using Ember CLI, and it translates it to the new modern ways of doing ESM modules, and all of your Emberisms go away. So what does that say up there? Does that say 20? Oh, well, that says 2021, but I think it was 2019 was some of the earlier ones. And, you know, Ed did the first few versions of this, and then it was job done. Everybody could just use ESM, and it's not a problem anymore. But of course, anybody who knows the history knows that that's not what happened. It would be great if it was so simple, but that is not what happened. The issue was that, as I said before, Ember CLI had all these capabilities, and people were using those capabilities. They were adding those features, and Embroider would work probably for very simple apps that weren't using add-ons that were doing anything strange. And every single one of your add-ons and packages had perfectly defined dependencies, peer dependencies, and all that sort of stuff. But the issue is, as we've said before, Ember, Ember loves community solutions. We love coming up with an idea and then sharing it with everybody. And you can very easily get a popular add-on used by 20 to 30% of the whole community. And if it gets into the blueprint, it can be even more than that. And there are a number of popular add-ons that did weird and wonderful things with uh, the uh, Ember CLI capabilities. So one example that I can think of was Ember Composable Helpers that uh, allowed you to decide which of the helpers would end up in your bundle. This isn't trying to dunk on Dockyard either. This is like actually going above and beyond. When people say, oh, they want smaller bundles, you give people a feature to be able to say, oh, actually, I want to, uh, I want to only have these um, helpers, or I want to exclude these helpers. It's really quite a useful tool. But these were micro-optimizations, and it's not really, it's dealing with the symptoms and not the underlying problem. We needed some way to start tackling the big problem of Ember CLI. Um, and it is essentially baked into this concept of add-ons. Add-ons had so much capability, and if you look at the API definition of what an add-on can or can't do, it's really quite extreme. So what we needed was a new way. And also these capabilities were built up over time. They were like one thing was added and one thing was added and then they interop interoperated between each other. So because there was no spec, there was no definition of what needed to happen, we needed, we needed to come up with a spec. And this is kind of how I imagine Ed working on the uh, V2 add-on spec, trying to work with Ember CLI and just not really caring about the House of Cards falling down. Um, obviously, it was a lot more well thought out and you know there was a lot of deep thinking that went into that. Um, but 
the, the thing that was most useful about the V2 add-on spec is that it specified an add-on in a way that was as close as we can get to a normal ESM package. So we can understand it statically, it doesn't influence the build system. And getting the spec out there so early meant that a few of the uh, more common uh, add-ons could move to this and it would solve one half of the problem. But it actually, uh, I, I assume intentionally solved the other half of the problem. If we look at Embroider as a translation system, one of the things that Embroider can then do is look at all your old add-ons and translate them so they match the new spec. And this introduces um, our first concept of how Embroider does what it does. Uh, I did say that Embroider is a translation system before, but how Embroider translates an old Ember app to new JavaScript uh, systems is really important. And we have this concept in Embroider called stages. So stage one is that we rewrite all of your add-ons to be V2 add-ons. So if anybody here is using Embroider, you can take a look at this today. Uh, all you have to do is like do one build and then in your node modules, Embroider rewritten packages folder, you'll see that there's like a big bunch of add-ons that uh, are things that you might recognize, some of them you've installed. Ember Source is gonna be in there for at least a little while longer until we can turn that into a V2 add-on. Um, but you'll probably notice if you have any kind of reasonably sized app that there's a lot more in there than you've got in your package JSON because it's not just rewriting your add-ons, it's rewriting any add-on that your add-ons are uh, consuming if they've declared in their dependencies. And not only that, because of the way the broccoli works with this weird file layering thing, there are cases where the same version of the same add-on needs to have two representations because they were built in different ways. So you have this weird superset of rewritten add-ons that represent uh, what your app is trying to consume. So uh, this may seem like a bit of a nightmare to keep track of, like this massive list of different versions of pre-compiled add-ons, but it's actually an awful lot simpler to do it that way than it is to try and get any later stage in the embroider build system to understand broccoli, because broccoli is very hard to get perfectly right, essentially. Um, the next stage, in the embroider build system is rewriting your app. So you've just rewritten all of your add-ons. Now you have to rewrite your, your actual app into a system that packagers will understand. So by packages, I mean Webpack. So if you're using Embroider today, uh, if you're using the stable version, you're using Embroider Webpack because that's the only way to consume it. Um, so again, if you want to see what it looks like for your rewritten app, you run a build, and then you look in node modules dot embroider rewritten app, and you'll you'll see that there's some files, and the structure of that rewritten app differs from your like normal repo that you cloned. Um, I will say that there's a, bit, a word of caution here. I'm talking about this as rewriting your app. Um, uh, as if it's something that will be happening for a long time. This is something that the current stable embroider is doing, and we are working very, very hard to actually eliminate this step. There will still be a stage that writes a few files, but there won't be this concept of rewriting your app anymore, and I'll explain a bit more about that in a minute. Um, so now, we have rewritten add-ons and a rewritten app. We have to move on to stage three, which is passing this set of things that we've translated with Embroider to the new way of doing things onto a packager. So conceptually, that's just like running Webpack and pointing it at this rewritten app. Um, but unfortunately, uh, that is in theory. And today, the uh, stable embroider version 
doesn't just point Webpack at this. We actually run Webpack inside a broccoli tree that consumes all of the stuff out of the first two stages. This is really hard to understand. Even if you know and love broccoli like I do, it's still very hard to understand. And if you look at the code that does this, not only is it trying to kind of perfectly balance exactly when to do what, it's also reaching into Webpack's internals in a way that, okay, Webpack's API is not that helpful to us. It's hard to do some of the things that we need to do, but this isn't really doing it the Webpack best practices way, and there is a better way to do it. Um, but to understand that better way, we need to do a, have a, a bit of a lesson. We need to do a bit of a backstory. And this is the second thing that I want you to go away from this talk with, and a better understanding of the Rollup API. So uh, this is something that is useful for two reasons. Um, I could talk about this in terms of Webpack, or rather I couldn't talk about this in terms of Webpack because Webpack's very hard to understand. And a rollup is a lot simpler. But also, um, myself and Ed joke a little bit when we talk about these things that all APIs are eventually going to just converge to be the rollup API. Vite's API is essentially the rollup API. You can think of ES Build's API using the same concepts as Rollup API. It is well designed and well structured, so it's really quite useful in that regard. Um, there is a problem though. It's, the API is great, it's very useful, it has all of the things that we need, but it is hard to get the conceptual understanding of how and why you need to use it. So I'm gonna do a bit of a crash course, and I've got a timer, I've got timers everywhere up here, um, and I'm gonna try and explain the Rollup API from a 50,000 foot level in two minutes. So I'm going to start the clock. Uh, actually, I can click and start a new clock. Boom, starting the clock. So the point, let's start with the point Rollup, and then we'll go into a bit of an example. The point of Rollup is in its name. You are, it's designed to look at your application and roll everything up. So think JavaScript files, roll them all up into one bundle that is like easier for the browser to download all at once. And the way that it starts rolling up all of the dependencies of your app is using a series of plugins. And this is probably the most basic structure of a rollup plugin. It's just a function that may or may, may not take some options that returns an object with hooks in it. And that function, uh, resolve ID, that's what a hook is. So the, obviously that's quite simple, but the number of hooks and what exactly they do is quite complex. I'm not gonna look at all of these things because I don't have time and people want lunch. So uh, I'm gonna look at only two of these hooks. And the two hooks that I'm gonna look at are resolve ID and load. And if you understand the behavior between resolve ID and load, you should be able to essentially infer the other things that you can do with Rollup. So when Rollup starts looking at your app, you have to give it an entry point. And you can think of the entry point as your index HTML. And by default, when you're using Vite, that's what it does. If there's an index HTML in, your, in the root of your app, it starts there and starts walking down. So you have a robot looking at your app, and it's just walking down each line, looking for something that's importing something. I'm going to skip, skip ahead to the uh, really interesting stuff. So this is the entry point into our JavaScript file. Um, there's a little bit of an oddity there that I'm going to explain a little bit later, but inside that entry point, you have your app.js. So everyone here who has an Ember app has an app slash app.js, and that's kind of conceptually where the app starts. Um, and hopefully once the whole build system is done, that's the thing that you actually import and then you run boot on it. But that's a story for another day. Um, and when Rollup gets to this line, 
we suddenly have something to do when we're looking at uh, resolve ID and load. So uh, resolve, resolve ID is talking about the right-hand side of that import statement. So we see ember slash application, and the job of resolve ID is to try and figure out where that is coming from. Um, you can think of it in terms of like NPM packages and stuff like that. Um, but the way that it works is you get passed in this source. We call it specifier sometimes. So source is that right-hand side of an import statement. And the importer, the file that had that thing in it. And if you don't return anything from this function, it doesn't do anything. And it passes it on to the next rollup plugin and see if there's anybody else who can do the resolve ID. But if you return something from the resolve ID, you can essentially redirect. You can say, hey, I don't want to get this from where you would assume to get it. I want you to get it from this other place. And if we remember back to Embroider has rewritten all of your uh, classic add-ons, Ember source itself is a rewritten add-on. It has been rewritten to like a V2 structure inside your Embroider build. And this is like the simplest possible representation of what Embroider is doing. Um, and when I was writing this, I had a bit of an existential crisis to that, you know, all the work that I've been doing for the last year could just be represented as a series of if statements. Um, but I guess that's, that's a Turing machine, so everything could be done like that. So anyway, we're not getting distracted. We have, a, we have a function here that gets a source, and we check to see if the source is the thing that we're looking for. And if it is the known thing that we're looking for, we say, don't go where you would expect to find that. Go to this other place, and we give it the path. So that's the resolve ID half of this done. We've redirected it to somewhere else. So once the resolve ID is done and all of the other plugins had their chance to uh, interact with this resolve ID, we then have to load that file. So I like to think of this as like, what does the left-hand side of that import statement actually mean? So if you have tried to import something from somewhere and it's redirected you, we see here that I'm checking in the load function if the ID is this thing that we returned from the resolve ID, we're giving it an answer. And that answer is just the source of the module. And we're exporting default something from there. And this is quite useful. Um, usually, you don't do something like this unless you're working with uh, virtual files, so you do want to have like a known string and a different answer. Um, but this is essentially a way for you to change what it means to do something, to, to load something off disk, essentially. OK, so stop the clock. And it was well over two minutes. But uh, hands up who has a better understanding of what the rollup API does compared to what, oh, that's great, success. Uh, I can eat lunch happy. That's great. Um, OK, so it's a simplified example. It doesn't express all of the things that, uh, that Embroider is doing. But you can kind of start to see how these two pieces can marry up together. If we spend all this time rewriting your add-ons, and then we notice when somebody is importing something from one of those add-ons, if we keep track of where we rewrote everything, we can give you a different answer when somebody asks for that. And that's essentially another thing that's in your .embroider folder. If anybody has an embroider build, you should check. There's a uh, node modules .embroider resolver.json that has all of them matching between the from and the to, and also like where it was required from. And that kind of helps you solve the uh, the versioning issues as well. So if you're interested, go and have a look. It's, it's a lot of data, but it's interesting at least. OK, so I spent all this time talking about the problem space and what we're doing right now. But I want to talk about what's happening next. What does the future of this build system look like? Um, 
I've had this question recently, like, is Embroider ready? Can I use it now in production? And I think it's ready. There are lots of people probably in this room who are using Embroider in production, but it does still have a few gotchas that are like performance problems or some things that are, just means it's not the default for everybody. If you do Ember new, it's not Embroider right now. But we're working very hard to make that the case. And the, the absolute front line work that we're doing on that is uh, the upcoming version of Embroider fully supports Vite. And it fully supports Vite in a way that all of our uh, tests on the main branch of Embroider are running against Vite and essentially nothing else for now. Um, in the future, we'll backport some Webpack uh, uh, support on this as well. But that's also a story for another day. Um, Vite is really a game changer for Ember builds. One of the things, the table stakes that a lot of people talk about nowadays is build speed and rebuild speed. And if you have a lot of developers and they are waiting 10 seconds, 15 seconds for a rebuild, that's not great. Uh, Vite changes the game a little bit because um, instead of rolling everything up and giving you a, like a combined built JavaScript file, when you're running in dev mode, it actually just asks the server for every module. So this resolve ID load, the load is a HTTP request across the network, say, hey, give me the value of this file. And that means that if you change something, if you change a file and you just need to change one module, that's near instant rebuild because you just had to re-request one module and everything else is cached in the browser, which is pretty good. Um, but we do have a problem. The problem is that if you pointed Vite at our rewritten app, and we do at the moment, it gets a little bit confused because our rewritten app is this built folder inside node modules, and Vite needs to know where all its dependencies are coming from. And it's just not, it's not the best structure for Vite. So our plan at the moment is to remove the need for the rewritten app so that you can just point Vite at the source of your repo and have everything essentially work, work it out from there. Um, that means that we have to implement things a little bit differently. So right now, or uh, well, right now on stable, when you look at your rewritten app, you'll see that your index HTML is completely different from what you have in your app index HTML. Uh, that's not true anymore for, uh, for the Vite, for the main um, version. And that actually means that uh, you have to change your uh, authoring format, which is a good word that we had today. You have to change in your repo, your index HTML needs to not be stuff that Ember CLI could add to or change. It needs to be actually what Vite can understand. So you can see here a recent diff um, where we are pointing directly at these, um, at embroider slash core slash vendor CSS, vendor JS. They are virtual files that embroider and Vite are able to understand using rollup plugins where to go and get the contents for those files. Um, and with this example, it's probably a good time to uh, thank both the Embroider Initiative, which has allowed myself and Maureen Dunstetter to work on this for the last, well, Maureen's been on for about six months now, and I've been on for the last year, where all of these companies have provided so that we could work on this full time and bring it to the Ember community. But it's not just about the initiative backers. Maureen Dunstetter has been doing this amazing amount of work essentially removing the need for the rewritten app. And there's literally, literally a pull request ready for me to merge or for Ed to merge uh, that will move us one step closer. And what does it mean to move one step closer? This is the current diff of our, um, of our source app and the rewritten app. And there's 
two kind of massive changes here that you can see. First of all, the environment JS is, is different. I'm not gonna go into the details, but Marine has got a pull request that changes that, fixes it, and that's done. I've got a pull request that changes the package JSON to be the same, and that covers the other diff. And then the last thing that we have to do is you can see that the app structure has been changed a little bit. Everything that's in the app folder has been splatted out into the root here. We're gonna put it back into the app folder. So your source and your rewritten app is exactly the same, and then we just turn off the process. Um, so this is all well and good, this is all very theoretical, but what does that mean for you today? Can you try this today? Uh, I gave a talk about the progress that we've been making at Ember Europe, and within a week, what I said for you to do to try this out was out of date. And if I merge that thing from Marine, if I tell you what to do now, it'll be out of date. So we can't do that sort of process anymore. We need a better way for people to try this out and keep up to date. So it's with great pleasure that I want to announce today the Vite App Blueprint. So this... <laughs> this is exactly what it smells like. It is a way for you to say Ember New, but not the old Ember New. This is the new Ember New. This is what our future is gonna be. It, this is going to be the basis of what people are gonna get when they say Ember New. We're gonna make this the default, that people get a Vite experience right out the gate when they start with Ember, and it's going, to, it's going to bring us way more in line with the build system story for all of the other JavaScript communities. Um, and most importantly, if you do this today, you can do Ember CLI update on it, and if it, stop, if it stops working because we've released something in Embroider, just Ember CLI update, and we will keep track of this. We have CI checking it every day, so if it breaks, we know it's broken, um, but yeah. Try it out, let us know, and uh, that's it. <laughs>